All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the fellow you have all been waiting for, Professor James A. Robinson, I will now hand it over to him, and uh, he will present to us why nations fail. Thank you very much, Professor. Take it away. Okay, yeah, my pleasure. I'm sorry about the confusion uh, um, this morning. Um, so, 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 okay, I'm going to talk about why nations fail. I, 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 I tried to find my slides, and I, I you know, this one appeared, and this is like, it's the last time I talked about it, actually, um, because I have a new book, you know, he said he, 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 he egregiously exploited the opportunity to advertise his new book. And so, you know, so here's the, I, I was talking about this in Taiwan, and so, you know, here's the Taiwanese cover of Why Nations Fail, just for fun. And so, you know, so what's this book about? Um, I think, you know, that, 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 that when, when Asimoglu and I started writing this book, uh, you know, we, we at some point we sort of thought, you know, well, how could you sum up the whole idea of the book in one slide? And then we thought about it for a few days and then we came up with this, which is the Korean Peninsula at night. So more or less everything in the book is, you know, is in this picture here. Uh, and you can see just at a sort of superficial level, uh, South Korea is very bright, his soul, there's the demilitarized zone and North Korea is very dark. Okay, so, so, so that, that, that represents, of course, it represents technological differences in South Korea. They have a lot of electricity, they have a lot of light bulbs, uh, and, 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 you know, and that's, that's, they have manufacturing industry, they have internationally competitive corporations, you know, they have a level of living standards, so that, that light reflects enormous differences in living standards and levels of development between North and South Korea. And what's particularly interesting about that difference, it's very stark, you can see, is that it didn't exist in, you know, 70 years ago, that didn't exist at all. It's completely the consequence of the different way in which North Korea and South Korea organized themselves subsequent to 1950. North Korea created this sort of socialist economy, they opposed markets, it was run by a one party, very personalized di communist dictatorship. South Korea, they had markets, they invested in capital, they had entrepreneurship, they had all the things that economists have known since the work of Robert Solow in the 1950s, create economic development, investment in physical capital, human capital, education, innovation, new technologies, new ideas, businesses, entrepreneurship. So, so that's not a, what generates prosperity is not a mystery. You know, if you look at every successful experience of economic development in the world, you know, in the lot, you know, it doesn't matter when it is, you could go all the way back to ancient Athens, which is sort of small by modern standards, but you still find many of the same things. You find innovation, you find investment, you find entrepreneurship, uh, you find governments providing basic services and public goods and the, you know, the same elements. And that all of that that Solo identified in the 1950s happened in South Korea after 1950, and it didn't happen in North Korea. And, and this is, you know, this is an example of what I would call a natural experiment in the sense that, you know, if you wanted to test a hypothesis about what causes economic development, ideally you'd, you'd have an experiment. You know, if you, if you thought that um, uh, economic development is caused by uh, democracy or something, then you'd want to sort of randomly create democracy in some countries and see how they did, you know, relative to non-democratic countries. But of course, that's, you can't actually do something like that. You can't do an experiment on such a large scale. So in social science, we look for sort of experimental-like situations. And this is an example of that in the sense that what is it that divides North Korea and South Korea? It's this completely arbitrary military border where the fighting stopped, you know, at the end of the 1940s. So it's not that, you know, the really nice kind of economically attractive parts of the Korean peninsula, you know, happen to be in the South and the South Koreans got those and the North Koreans got stuck with the barren kind of, you know, in fact, if anything, the North was richer in 1950. Most of the industry that was created during the Japanese colonial period, for example, was actually in the North, not the South. So, so, so the idea is it's a sort of, it's like a, it's, it's as if, it's like an experiment. You know, you kind of have this arbitrary border 
And then you create very different types of societies south of the border and north of the border, okay? And don't fixate on communism, okay? So from, from our perspective, communism is just a sort of this, communism at least as practiced by North Korea, is just an example of something much broader, which I'm gonna introduce some terminology for in a minute. Okay, so, 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 so this, you know, this is interesting for many reasons, you know, as a natural experiment. For one thing, it actually helps you rule out alternative explanations. So I'm not going to talk too much about that in this, in half an hour. We have a whole chapter in the book called Theories That Don't Work, and a lot of our scientific research is sort of trying to discriminate between these different hypotheses. But, but what created that enormous difference, for example, can't be cultural. You know, the Korea, Korean peninsula has at least a thousand year history of common culture, language, sort of pre-Japanese colonial political institutions, state institutions. So, so Surely there are large cultural differences between the North and the South today, but that's something that's been produced by this divergence. It's not the cause of the divergence. Similarly, geography, it's very hard to think that there's some dramatic difference in the geography of the, or the ecology of the Korean peninsula that could possibly explain that. And it's kind of obvious to everybody when you think about what, you know, you know anything about Korea, you sort of know it's obvious that this is to do with the very different way that South Korea got organized. South Korean society created institutions, so that's the word we use a lot, uh, you know, by which we mean just kind of the rules that people themselves create, which creates incentives and opportunities. They created very different types of institutions in the South compared to those that got created in the North. And those different sorts of institutions created dramatically different patterns of incentives. And that's what created all of this economic development in South Korea. And it's the absence of incentives and opportunities in the North that created this poverty. So, so this, this, this difference didn't exist 70 years ago. And now, you know, the income per capita in South Korea is probably about 30 times larger than North Korea. North Korea has an income per capita of a Sub-Saharan Africa, poor Sub-Saharan African country, and South Korea, you know, is in the member of the OECD and as you know, and is one of the most prosperous uh, economies in the world. So, so another nice experiment we like, you know, is here's another border uh, between Nogales. You know, Nogales on the right is in the United States, north of the border. Nogales on the left is in Mexico, south of the border, you know, so it's sort of one town and it has a fence stuck down the middle, okay? So again, you know, this, this is a sort of natural experiment in the book, we talk about the history of Nogales and, you know, how it formed culturally very similar, you know, it's a very Latin uh, culture, north and south of the border, you go, people drink the same thing, they listen to the same music, everyone's speaking Spanish, you know, north of the border too. Uh, but very different institutions. So just as there were institutions north of the, different institutions north of the demilitarized zone in the Korean peninsula compared to south of the demilitarized zone, very different institutions here on the left compared to the right. This is an old photograph. Now, nowadays, of course, you can imagine after the Trump presidency, there's a much bigger, kind of uglier, more aggressive wall down the middle of Nogales, you know. Uh, so, but I, you know, I like the older photograph. So, 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 you know, but, but there's enormous concept, just like being in North Korea, you know, where there's the kind of ever present threat of famine compared to South Korea has enormous consequences for people's lives and their welfare. So do, does being, you know, to the left of the fence compared to the right of the fence. So, you know, to the left of the fence, you have the hegemony of all these drug cartels. You have enormous insecurity and violence, for example. And on the right, you know, you have something, you have something very, you have something very different. Okay, so, so we use this as another natural experiment to sort of talk about these institutional differences and how that must be what's causing this. It can't be geography or culture or many of the other things that people talk about as driving economic development. And in the chapter where we tell the sort of history of the Americas, I won't go into that in detail, I, I'll talk about the bit I like the best, which is right at the end of the chapter, we don't talk about, you know, two places, North or South Korea or 
or, or Nogales, north and south of the border, we talk about two people, Bill Gates and Carlos Slim, who were the richest, two richest people in the world at the time wrote the book. And what's interesting about, you know, Bill Gates and Carlos Slim is, is Carlos Slim, Mexican, Bill Gates from the US, is both very rich, but the way they made their money is incredibly significant. So Gates, you know, for all the problems with Microsoft and whatever people like to complain about Microsoft, he made his fortune through innovation in, in the computer industry, okay? He started a business, incredibly successful. You know, he became very wealthy, sucking talent and energy and ideas into the computer software industry. Carlos Slim made his money through a monopoly. He got his friends in the Mexican government, the PRI government, to privatize the state telecom monopoly to him, okay? With no restrictions on pricing or regulation. So he could basically soak the Mexican consumer for all he could. The OECD uh, did a very conservative calculation of what, what the welfare costs of this monopoly were to Mexican society. And you know, over a five year period, uh, it, it calculated that there was a welfare loss of 120 billion Dollar, US dollars. So that's about double Carlos Slim's fortune. So, 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 you know, this is just like undergraduate economics. It's not, it's not just that this is taking money from the average Mexican and giving it to Carlos Slim. It's actually reducing national income in Mexico as well. Gates, that's the opposite with Gates. That's the opposite. Gates generated all sorts of positive externalities that dragged people and talent and energy into the software business. Now, what's, what's Gates doing here? No, this is 1998. He's actually swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You know, what's he doing? He's appearing in front of antitrust authorities in Washington. Microsoft were found guilty of violating the Sherman Act. Okay. And so, just like this is, you know, this is not a story about good guys or bad guys or leaders or bad leaders or Bill Gates wanted to be a monopolist just like Carlos Slim. The only difference in the United States is not people's aspirations to become monopolists. You know, it's gone through the roof since we wrote this book 10 years ago, but the institutions that try to keep them under control and try to channel their energies in a socially desirable direction. That's what the Sherman Act did. And that's a long, deep kind of struggle in the United States, okay? Here's, a, here's let's go back, you know, a, almost 100 years before. And here's, you know, this is an octopus, but it's, a, it's, it's the head is an oil drum and you can see it says standard oil. And what was this, the standard oil octopus? It has its tentacles around the White House, around, you know, here's its oil wells. It has its tentacles around everything, around the Capitol building, around the White House. You know, it's, here's the White House, I guess, you know. And, and what was, this was Rockefeller's huge monopoly or cartel, you know, uh, trust, they called them at the time. What happened to the Standard Oil Company? It was broken up under the Sherman Act at the start of the last century. So, so this battle goes back a long way, you know, back into the 1870s and 1880s when all of this antitrust regulation started. So that's about the institutions. You know, it's about the institutions which can enforce something like the Sherman Act on, you know, the world's richest person uh, and, and, and can create incentives for him to innovate. So, so this is about Bill Gates and Carlos Slim, both very clever, energetic business people operating in very different institutional environments with very different incentives created by those institutions. The way to get rich in the United States is to innovate, you know, for all, again, Bezos, you know, he might be wasting his money going into space or whatever, but at the end of the day, he made his money by giving something, giving people something that they didn't have and that they, and that they valued and they wanted. And it's really globalization that sort of created this ludicrous kind of wealth for him. Yeah, there's monopoly too. There's, there's network externalities and there's all sorts of things going on like that, you know, so, 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 but that's very different in Latin America. The way to make a fortune in Latin America is still the way Carlos Slim made it, which is use your political contacts, you know, get monopolies. And you look at, line up all the richest people in Latin America, that's how they, that's how they made their money. Okay, so, so, so let, let's, you know, let me, you know, just to see, there's a big scandal about the PRI 
The PRI, you know, gave Carlos Slim his monopoly. The last PRI government about which there's a huge scandal this week, eavesdrop, you know, eavesdropping on using modern technology to eavesdrop on all its opponents. Before they left power, they, 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 they commissioned a new airport in Mexico City. Here it is, designed by Carlos Slim's son-in-law to be built by Carlos Slim. So President Lopez Obrador actually cancelled it. You know, let's see how that goes. But, 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 you know, so the whole thing, cozy relationship goes on and on. So let me, let me introduce some sort of terminology here. You know, so these dichotomies, North Korea, South Korea, Nogales, North of the Fence, Nogales, South of the Fence, you know, what was it about, you know, we in the book, we introduced this terminology to kind of talk about these different sorts of institution, institutions. I sort of say, you know, in the, in the North, in the Korean case, it's not that North Korea was a sort of avowedly communist or socialist regime, but that's not what I'm talking about here. Okay. So, and the, the label we put on the kind of economic institutions, the institutions that create incentives and opportunities in the economic sphere, what, you know, what was it that Bill Gates responded to? What was it that made South Korea so successful? Is because they had what we call inclusive economic institutions. And inclusive economic institutions are economic institutions that create very broad-based incentives and opportunities in society, okay? And that word inclusive, I want to dwell on that word inclusive, you know, with the following, to come back to light bulbs. You know, I started off... I started off with, with, with um, you know, I started off with North Korea and South Korea. So I want to come back to the light bulb. My, my wife always says, you know, that maybe, maybe North Koreans just think candles are more romantic, you know, than, but anyway, so, 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 so here's the light bulb. You know, what's the light bulb? Innovation. This is a patent taken out by uh, Edison in 1880. And the patent system is a very, very interesting example of an inclusive economic institution because anyone could pay the same fee and file a patent and the state protected your intellectual property rights okay and that created incentives and innovation all right so 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 this inclusion but but why inclusion you know because if you look at the for example there's the work of ken the great economic historian ken sokolov on on the social background of inventors in the United States in the 19th century. What Ken showed is that, is that innova innovators came from all over the social spectrum. Elites, farmers, artisans, lawyers, professional, you know, man, from all sorts of backgrounds, uneducated, highly educated. Edison's father was a roofing contractor. You know, he was homeschooled. By, you know, but he was a very brilliant, talented person. And the idea is that, you know, if you want to have a dynamic, successful economy, you have to set up a set of institutions or rules that can just tap into all that latent talent that you have out there. Okay, people with ideas and creativity and projects, and they want to start a business, they want to do their thing, they want to have their dream. They, but where are those people? You, you don't know where they are. You know, I don't know where they are. The government doesn't know where they are. So you need a system of rules, of institutions that allow those people to come to the top to get financing, to get property rights. To, the state has to protect their property rights. So, so including that's key to any kind of, you know, like I, I, you know, when I work in Africa, I always think, you know, we work with a lot of Africans and collecting data or whatever. And you just meet all these incredibly clever people. And you just, it's like so much wasted talent. So many, so people was just so much talent and energy and, and, and just stuck in, stuck, you know, stuck without opportunities. And, 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 you know, that's the tragedy of poverty and, and underdevelopment. So, so just to say, you know, this word inclusion is, 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 is significant. Okay, so, so that's, but that's the economics, okay? So, so yeah, it's very simplistic, this, this di dichotomy between inclusive economic institutions and extractive economic institutions. Extractive economic institutions are what they have in North Korea. They're economic institutions that don't create incentives or opportunity for the broad mass of people. They create incentives and opportunity for a few people, for politically powerful or politically connected people like Carlos Slim, but most people don't have incentives. Most people don't have opportunities. Okay, you don't have opportunity to get into the telecom business in Mexico, you know, if you're not well connected like Carlos Slim is. Okay, so it blocks extractive institutions, block people's incentives, and they block 
opportunities and they create poverty. Okay, so that's that's the dichotomy. But where do they come from? You know, where do these institutions come from? Why, why is it that North Korea has extractive economic institutions? Why is it that South Korea has something different? Again, that's obvious. It's about politics. And as you remember, so I said the Korean Peninsula, is, you get the whole argument. Okay, it's about politics. It's because political power is concentrated in North Korea in the hands of sort of personal hands of this communist dictatorship. That's why you have extractive economic institutions. Why did you have a patent act like this? You know, why did the patent system open up in this inclusive way? Because in the 19th century, the US, it was not like a modern democracy, you know, women couldn't vote and, 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 and you know, after the black people were disenfranchised, you know, they, were, they were, didn't have voting rights until 1865. And after 1865, they were pretty soon disenfranchised again. So, so this is not a perfect democracy. But by world historical standards, you know, adult white men were represented. And that was enough. Political power was sufficiently spread that the institutions had to respond to that and the government had to respond to that. So it was, again, the very different sorts of politics that created very, it's the politics that creates inclusive economic institutions and it's the politics that creates extractive economic institutions. So what do we call that? Well, I'll give you my favorite example from the book. Uh, you know, President Mugabe. I, I, I've done a lot of work in Zimbabwe. I have these very good Zimbabwean friends. So here's a story I like from the BBC. Zimbabwe, late, 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 the late President Mugabe was a remarkable man in many ways. Brilliant. He was a brilliant politician. Uh, Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe has won the top prize in a lottery organized by a partly state owned bank. Okay. Master of Ceremonies, Falat. Chihuahua could hardly believe his eyes when the ticket drawn for the Zimbabwe hundred thousand dollar Zimbabwean prize. So, so here's Mugabe, you know, running a more or less autocratic state, uh, winning the lottery. You know why? Just to show he could. You know, to use his power to show his power. Okay. So, so there's extract. You know, Zimbabwe is poorer now than it was in 1960. Uh, you know, I think it's fair to say. That's a situation with extractive economic institutions. Why are there extractive economic institutions? Because there are extractive political institutions. And that's, this is an illustration of that. So, so, so we sort of say, lying behind the economics, there's the, there's the politics. What is it that creates inclusive economic institutions? It's inclusive political institutions. And, and I've sort of emphasized two aspects of that. One is, you know, power has to be distributed broadly, but also the state has to have capacity. You know, when I talked about the Sherman Act, I emphasized, I emphasized the ability of the state to enforce the Sherman Act on the richest person in the world. So, so you know, Mexico uh, or Colombia, where I work a lot, you know, my wife is Colombian, and Colombia has beautiful antitrust laws. You know, I know the people who wrote them, but the, the, the Colombian government is incapable of enforcing them against rich Colombians, you know, so, so you could never drag, I won't name them, but you know, they know who they are. You could never drag these guys into the, the way that Bill Gates was dragged in, you know, or Zuckerberg or, you know, what, so, so that's the, it, the ability of the state to enforce. So, so it's the inclusive in our, it's both power has to be broadly distributed in society but the state has to have capacity. And, and we call it extractive political institutions when either of those fail. And, you know, and, 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 and let me, can I, can I have five more minutes? Is that good, do you think? Well, yeah, of course. Uh, please okay. take all the time you need. And then right. so, 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 so let me, you know, let me, let me come back to Paul Samuelson. So, so here's the, Here's the theory, you know, here's the book in the diagram. So this diagram isn't in the book because, because the editor said it was too complicated and it would put people off. But I like it anyway. So, 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 and you know, here's North Korea and Mexico. We've been talking about North Korea and Mexico. And here's extractive economic institutions. And here's, you know, extractive political institutions. So they have extractive economic institutions because they have extractive political institutions. And economically successful places like Canada have much more inclusive economic institutions. And in our world, you know, it's politics that drives that. Okay, so, so we're sort of, 
we're political determinists, if you like. Uh, and so it's the inclusive nature I've been emphasizing, inclusive nature of political institutions with these two dimensions, you know, that, uh, that creates inclusive economic institutions. So from our perspective, you know, the problem of kind of development, uh, the problem in a country like Zimbabwe, you know, or China in the 1970s is to kind of move from from this lower right cell in the matrix to the top left cell in the matrix. Okay, so China, for example, how would we think about the economic development of China since the 1970s? Well, in 1978, China was a country with very extractive economic institutions and very extractive political institutions. Okay, what did it do under Deng Xiaoping? Well, Deng Xiaoping started to dismantle all of these controls, controls on what people could do, controls on what people could own, controls on what people, where people could live. So he, he just dismantled the kind of communist economy on, on, you know, but, but again, this is not, you know, this is not a book about communism. It's about extractive institutions. Like for us, communist economic institutions are just one example out of many of extractive economic institutions. So, but, you know, as a matter of fact, China did have avowedly communist economic institutions in the 1970s. So it moved in this direction. It moved it in the direction of making economic institutions less extractive and more inclusive. OK, so so now what do we say about that? OK, what, what now what now is that of China? China doesn't have inclusive political institutions. It has it's the dictatorship of the Communist Party. Again, you know, very, very personalistic nowadays. Deng Xiaoping tried to sort of institutionalize a different, less personalized model, and he failed. President Xi basically got rid of it. So, so now, now what? Okay, now, now, now what happens? Well, what we say in Why Nations Fail is the following, okay? So this isn't in the book either, because Asimoglu said it's too anti-MIT, but I like it. You know, so here's a figure from Paul Samuelson, his textbook. OK, you, you know, you're you're all too young, probably, to remember the Soviet Union. But but when I was an undergraduate at the London School of Economics in the early 1980s, we were taught that there was a big trade off. You know, if you wanted to have successful economic development, you had to have central planning Soviet style. Uh, but if you wanted to have democracy, you, you know, you had to have capitalism. So so it was sort of. You know that I mean, it's people laugh when 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 you say that nowadays to an audience because young people can't remember when they they, they find it kind of absurd that the Soviet Union never thought of as an economic miracle. But actually, there's, there's nothing left of it now. You know, but 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 in between, you know, the first five year plan in 1926 and and you know for 50 years, the Soviet Union did pretty well economically. Uh, and you know, here's Samuelson's book, 1961 with the USSR catching up to GDP in the United States. You know, so in 2000, it, of course, it disappeared in 19, 1990, but Paul Samuelson didn't know that in 1961. He was predicting the Soviet Union would, would, you know, would catch up with the US. 1967, still catching up in the year 2000. 1970, uh, okay, let's delay it 10 years, you know, let's delay it. Now then what happened in Samuelson's textbook is, is this picture disappeared, you know, for an edition or two, and then it came back with the axis relabeled, and instead of the USSR, it was China. You know? so, so, so I think like I, sh I show this, and we talk about it in the book just to say, you know, knowing a bit about history helps here. You know, there's many examples of kind of unsustainable, what we call extractive growth. China so big and impressive, you know, we kind of like, it's just easy to get blown away, but the Soviet Union was big and impressive for 50 years as well. So, so I, I guess the view we take in Why Nations Fail is basically, you can't have a modern, enduringly prosperous society with a, with a personalized dictatorship. That's just never been done. And, and you know, and uh, people can always come up with sort of idiosyncratic explanations for why China could be different, and, and that could be true. You know, it could be different. Uh, it could be culture. It's clearly culturally very different from Western countries, and so it could be, could be. But but the bulk of the evidence suggests this is very unlikely. What what we say in the book is these sort of off diagonals. You know, to go back to linear algebra, 
the off diagonals are sort of unstable. You know, this is very un this is very stable. Extractive economic institutions and extractive political institutions. That's a very stable situation. They reinforce each other. That's what we call the vicious circle. But it's also true, and this is a comforting thing for those of us sitting in the United States, you know, for four years under Donald Trump. It's also true that inclusion kind of, you know, we call this the virtuous circle. Inclusion fosters inclusion, you know. So, so, so this is a pretty stable situation. So there's two very stable equilibria here, but the off diagonals are unstable. You know, it's very hard to have an inclusive economy at the whim of a kind of dictatorship. That's what we say about China. And similarly, you know, here's, here's another case. I haven't got time to talk about examples, but, you know, if I was going to talk about South Africa, I'd say again, Apartheid South Africa, you know, was an extremely extractive economy. It was set up by white people to exploit Africans, you know, and, and white people had political power, black people were disenfranchised, and, and the economic institutions were kind of hideously extractive. So then what happens? Well, what happens? You know, what happens is democracy, you know, South Africa didn't really go the same way as China. South Africa democratized. Nelson Mandela became president, the ANC became the government. Africans could vote and they had political rights. But in the context of enormous legacy of extractive institutions, what do we say about that? Well, that's not stable either. You can't have extractive economic institutions in, a, in an inclusive political society. So, so, you know, we could talk about South Africa, but, 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 and Zimbabwe, you know, in many ways went in the same way and then it went into reverse, I would say. But again, I'm just emphasizing this sort of insta. I like this diagram, you know, and, and the off diagonals are unstable. Okay, so, so why don't I, that's, that's, I have another diagram, but I'm not gonna show you that. I'm, I think I should stop there. And, and I think I've met, you know, you've got the argument and um, I'm happy to answer questions. All right, well, thank you very much for, <laughs> for uh, sharing that with us. I really appreciate it. Uh, so for, all you viewers who were wondering why I <laughs> why I endorse this book so much, hopefully now that's given you a taste of it. I highly recommend checking out Why Nations Fail. And then, uh, Professor, if there's anything you wanted to say about uh, the narrow corridor at the end of the uh, at the end of the session, I invite you to do that as well. Um, I have a couple of questions that I wanted to go over with you, if uh, I can begin, and then uh, and then we're still collecting questions from the audience. Uh, so the biggest question I have is like right now, I'm part of a few different social media groups and there is a huge argument between it's all capitalism versus socialism and that's kind of besides the point. Now, how do we begin to teach people how exclusive institutions are founded and how do we prevent these the people who are ready for revolution from, from uh, enacting the iron law of oligarchy? and just create, you know, trying to overthrow extractive institutions and then replacing them with new extractive institutions. Well, you know, I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of discontent, you know, at the moment with in the extent of inequality, the enormous sort of concentration of wealth that's taking place, you know, in, in the kind of, in the Anglo-Saxon world, you know, it's not happening in Sweden or Denmark, you know, but in the Anglo-Saxon world, you know, it, it, is hap it is happening. And, you know, and I, I, think, I think that's, uh, you know, that you could sort of say that this process of innovation and, you know, what we talk about creative destruction in the book, you know, it does create winners and losers and it does create inequality. And, you know, and, and so there's a very important role for the government to, to provide social insurance, to, to help people, you know, to invest in, public goods and to redistribute wealth you know i don't think the 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 model of capitalism in the us at the moment is you know is terribly stable it seems to me you know this enormous concentration of wealth so so i think if you look at the history of of you know the development of kind of what you know what 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 what, what economic historians call modern economic growth there's a sort of coevolution of markets and and inclusive economic institutions and the state you know that's why i emphasize you know, state capacity. That's why I emphasize, you know, the Sherman Act and the and antitrust authorities getting Rockefeller under control and trying to get Bill Gates under control because the market can't do everything on its own. The state has to provide some basic services. And I think that's, that's in terms of public goods and, you know, but it's also just in terms of 
fairness and equity, it seems to me. There's just some limit to, you know, okay, Bezos may have come up with this fantastic thing, you know, Amazon and, and, and whatever, and he's providing something people want and they value it and he's making huge amounts of money. But all these people are also exploiting loopholes, you know, in people's concepts of property rights. You know, they're taking your data without asking you and they're selling it to other people and nobody consulted you and they're making a fortune out of that. And is that, is that a legitimate thing or should they be compensating you? You know, do you have property rights over that? Or So they've also taken advantage of kind of loopholes in the system. And I think that's perfectly legitimate for us to think about that and question it and maybe change the course of things. So I, you know, I, I, I mean, that's kind of my, you know, I don't think, I think this is sort of misguided. Like, so any people who call these Democrats in the United States socialists don't know what socialism is. You know, there may be a few socialists like Bernie Sanders or whatever, but, you know, but I went to, I went to Albania, you know, when I was a student, uh, which was when I was a student in London, it was, it was billed as the only true communist society in the world, you know, so that, you know, I think I know what socialism looks like. So that, you know, it's not socialism. I think it's, 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 I would call it, you know, social democracy. But I think that's, I think that's a perfectly legitimate discussion. And I don't think, look at Sweden, look at Scandinavia. I don't think that undermines the health or the economic dynamism of the system, actually. I think, I think the way things have been going in the United States the last 20 or 30 years, I'm not sure that's really stable. So, you know, eventually it's going to come unhinged for different reasons, you know, and, and so, so that's, that's an important thing to anticipate and try to avoid, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. That's an excellent, uh, excellent reflection. I did just want to note quickly, uh, I have just been given an alert that there is a severe thunderstorm in my area. So if I suddenly lose power, uh, Christina, yeah. if you could please take over and I will get back as soon as I can. Uh, but I don't hear anything out my window at the moment. So hopefully things are good. Okay. But uh, just want to say that if that happens. And then uh, another uh, big question that I have, a lot of my work focuses on uh, the foundations of money and the essentially the formula that allows us to create money. And I want to touch on something you said in your presentation. Uh, we cannot have extractive economic institutions in inclusive societies. Uh, from all of my research that I've been doing, the very foundation of the U.S. Federal Reserve was designed to be a cartel. Uh, you were talking about Rockefeller Standard Oil before. Uh, he, uh, we have... We have the documents from his collaborations with J.P. Morgan, Conan Loeb, and the Rothschilds uh, to essentially uh, intercede on behalf of the government to create the United States Federal Reserve. Uh, everything that I have learned about fiat currencies, the very formula that they use is the basis of what you would call an extractive institution. So. And I know this is kind of a broad spectrum yeah. question, but how do we, how do we go forward, particularly in the, in the West, uh, with the way we create money being this system designed to push money upwards and extract or in debt other people or other, other countries completely? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't think any system is perfect. I, I'm sure you could argue that, you know, all sorts of nefarious things went on in the United States. And, you know, you could make and people have made, you know, arguments about, you know, why, you know, why does the government have this monopoly? You know, I mean, you could make arguments different way, you know, different ways. So Hayek made these arguments that it would be better if there was kind of free entry into you know, and, and, and good currency would drive out bad currency and sort of, you know, why can't you have market forces working? Why do you have this kind of monopoly type? And I, you know, I'm not sure I'd have a terribly sophisticated view about that. Like our monetary economics and I parted company a long time ago, but I, I know what you're saying. I would say it's just, it's, it's a matter of degree, you know, like I think that like our view, our view of the world is that, you know, human beings are sort of this very similar. They're like, that's the point of the Slim versus Gates example, right? There's nothing about Gates, good guy, Slim, bad guy. It's just humans, you know, and, and so humans, 
what you know it's in humans want to create monopolies it's in adam smith you know adam smith says what you know like you only get a few businessmen get together in a room and they come up with some plan to cheat the public you know so so you're always sort of struggling it's like a moving target it's like whacker this whacker mole you know you're always struggling to kind of you know and i just you know so i would say it, it, the us it's a very imperfect thing you know look 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 at the all of the racial discrimination and marginalization of people you know if you walk outside my office you know and you go right you know in three blocks you're in the south side of chicago you know and it's it's you know so you have these enormously neglected areas people suffering discrimination enormous barriers to social mobility and you know and lacking opportunities and and so 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 i think there's a you know just to say like from my perspective like thinking historically there's many things that you could point to and you're you know you're you're making an observation about the united states that don't really fit into this include you know this dichotomy between exclusion and extraction actually there's lots of gray areas i think i think that's exactly right but i guess i would say by world historical standards you know the us or canada or western europe have done a very good job of it like a kind of moving the you know moving the dial in the direction of inclusion with all of these consequences you know and and you know and 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 if you compare that to you know zimbabwe or colombia you know or wherever it is north korea that's that's a very significant distinction even though you know i'm not disagreeing with you that you can identify many aspects of extractive institutions in the united states i think it's just it's a moving target it's always a struggle yeah Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I know that it's a it's a bit of a broad spectrum question. So thanks for thanks for taking a shot That's at it. Question. I appreciate it. Uh, as, uh, and one of the things that I've been using your work to uh, help me build is uh, we're trying to create uh, we're trying to develop a, a, a private project outside of the YSI. But I've I've been working in uh, fintech uh, blockchain to try and design. A cryptocurrency that services what we would see as uh, inclusive uh, uh, mechanisms, a way to re-enfranchise the disenfranchised and give people more of a say in how money is created. So if you like the whole the whole world kind of needs to use U.S. dollars for good yeah. or, for, or for ill, but only people in the U.S. and only a few people in the U.S. get a say on you know, how that money is created. So, and yeah. I uh, don't want to take up uh, much more of yeah. your time as I know that we have, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm just getting a reminder that uh, we have, uh, the audience is very eager to ask questions. So uh, Christina, I am going to hand it over to you before I keep blabbing on, uh, but thank you very much, Professor, and uh, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat um, that we can just quickly uh, go to those. Um, so we have a question from Noe Martinez. Um, I'll read it out and then perhaps Noe, you can follow up if I have not uh, uh, properly articulated it. But the question is, uh, thank you, Professor, for the, for the space to share. Um, how did you select the examples of Morales Sonora and Morales Arizona and their institutions? Well, you know, I think, I think, I mean, we, we, you know, we worked a lot in Latin, I guess, you know, I think this Engelman, Engelman, Engelman and Sokolov's work on sort of the comparative historical development of the Americas was very important for us. Like uh, some of our early kind of scientific papers, we were very inspired by their historical study and we, we were trying to sort of do the same thing with statistics. And so I think we've always thought a lot and we've read a lot about the history of the Americas and this divergence between North America and, you know, Central or Latin America. And, and you know, so I, I don't remember how it came to, I think, I think it came to me actually because, I, or one of us, because we saw, so we saw that card, somebody sent me a card with that, with the fence on or something. I'm, I, try, I used to have it, I used to teach at University of California at Berkeley. And I used to have that card on my door. I said, I remember I have the, I don't even remember who sent it to me now. And at some point we just thought, you know, this is a beautiful kind of natural experiment. You know, like a lot of, a lot of empirical work, statistical analysis, you use these kind of borders and you try to argue that, you know, the borders are sort of arbitrary, you know, but they have these consequences and that allows you to say something about causality and, and, and the causal effect of some difference. So, so, so I think, you know, so there's a kind of econometric 
you know motivation for thinking about these borders and I, and but but I'm not really sure when that came into mind you know I think I think like you know most of our a lot of our work you know I mean we're trained as economists and we like math and statistics and things like that but you know to be honest with you I spend most of my time reading history books or books by anthropologists and most of you know, most economists are great, you know, but economists don't tend not to know anything about the world. Like, you know, like if you if you ask an economist about South Africa or something or Nigeria, they wouldn't know anything about the history or the institutions or that. And I've always found all of that sort of very fascinating. Just, my, you know, I'm a very detailed oriented person. So, so, so I like all the details. And I think, so we've always had, you know, we found inspiration from these historical studies and, and case studies and all sorts of things like that, but I, I I can't I can't really give a you know you could have chosen Nuevo Laredo or you know there's other places on the border El Paso you know there's other places on the border which would have had the same which would have been very similar uh, but you know great thank you Professor no way Charles Mingus great thank you Professor uh, no way you look satisfied so I guess we'll move on to the next question uh, yeah thank you so much. Fantastic. Um, the next question is from Ajibola Kanji, and um, allow me to rephrase it. So he asks, is the Nigerian Aliko Dangote, um, is Aliko Dangote the Nigerian equivalent of Carlos Slim? Yeah, I think so. He, he made most of his money in cement with government contracts, I guess, you know. Uh, so <laughs> I, I don't know so much details about Mr. Dangote, but, but, but I think I think I, I, that's what that's what my Nigerian friends tell me. Yeah, so exactly. So he has lots of connections and uh, uh, and he gets lots of government contracts and he made a fortune in cement. Yeah, it's a good analogy, I would say, based on what I know. Fair enough. Um, Ajbol is from Nigeria, so that question, I think, was um, personally inspired. <laughs> All right, those are the questions that we have in the chat. I suppose I'll leave an opportunity if anyone wants to raise their hand to ask a question directly. Uh, in the meantime, I guess I'll pose uh, one of my own questions, um, which might also be a segue uh, into your book, your latest book on the narrow corridor as well. Um, so from one, what I understand, uh, you discuss um, finding a balance between state and society um, that allows for the sort of this narrow gap to be developed for prosperity to flow. Um, and I'm wondering perhaps if you can maybe elaborate a little bit more on that. And so, you know, which societies maintain this balance uh, as best as possible as you perceive it? I guess that's the one question. And the second question, uh, which is a, a bit of a leading question, <laughs> but um, it, it's in reference to uh, Gunther Franken's book, book on authoritarian constitutions or authoritarian constitutionalism. And he makes the point that um, if you look closely, you would find that even societies like the US um, and various countries within uh, Europe display authoritarian characteristics. And I think you did touch on this when you said, you know, there is no perfect system. Um, but, I, but I guess it did make me wonder to what extent we factored this in, um, that even as we try to look for, you know, a model situation or model state that can kind of uh, give way to ideas around how the right kind of political institutions are developed that gives way to prosperity, even the models that we do have aren't perfect. And so I guess I, I'm wondering about your thoughts on this. Um, and then the yeah. last question, <laughs> the last question uh, relates to intellectual property. Um, so you discussed the patent system and how it's an inclusive institution within the US context. Um, but I wonder if globally we see that it tends to be quite exclusive. And I'm thinking about the TRIPS agreement, for example, which benefits developed countries like the US, um, but tends to disenfranchise uh, lesser developed countries like South Africa, where I'm from. And so, you know, thinking back to 2001, where there was that massive uh, incident with regards to anti-retroviral anti drugs, yeah. Uh, where, yeah, which uh, caused quite a lot of controversy around private companies gaining benefit over the public good. And so I'm just sort of wondering, you know, does that does that classification of you know intellectual property and patent system being an inclusive system still stand on a global perspective? And so there was a lot of questions, but I, but I hope yeah. we can pick something from out of there for for discussion. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. So I mean, it's difficult for me to talk about the new book in a couple of minutes. So I think I think I think you know one thing about it, which is which I like a lot, you know, relative to sort of why nations fail, is that it's much more of a you know we emphasize. You know, in some sense, you could say it, it's a much more dynamic theory of the emergence of inclusive institutions. You know, so I mean, I could actually, you know, I was going, I was going to show you one more diagram. So if I, I if I show you the, this one more diagram, which is the last diagram on these slides, it's actually 
it's actually kind of, you know, so, so remember when I talked about inclusive political institutions, I sort of said, oh, you have this broad distribution of power and you have a state which is strong or has capacity, you know, it can enforce antitrust regulations, let's say, it can raise taxes and, okay, you know, it can get drug cartels under control. So, so, so this is, in, in Why Nations Fail, you know, there's these two dimensions and, 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 and inclusive political institutions are this sort of top right cell. And what we say in Why Nations Fail, just to kind of keep, try to keep it simple, is, well, everything else has extractive political institutions. But of course, when you kind of unpack that and you look at this and you sort of say, oh, gosh, you know, these these places are really different, you know, like the Central African Republic, you know, or the DRC, you know, that that may have, you know, that may not that may have a pretty narrow distribution of political power and it has a pretty weak state. But that's very different from other types of societies with extractive institutions. China's not like that at all. You know, or North Korea, they have much more effective state authority they have powers narrowly concentrated and on the down here you could sort of say well somalia you know like if you think about you know traditional somali society actually it was incredibly democratic you know there's a very famous ethnography of northern somalia called a, a pastoral democracy you know and and why because adult men collectively made decisions you know so so there was a huge amount of participation in society so that's not a society run by a narrow elite uh, but of course, it's a state, you know, traditional Somali society didn't have any kind of centralized state whatsoever. You know, it was what anthropologists would have called a segmentary lineage society. So, so then, you know, in some sense, the white, you know, if you want to think about the narrow corridor is, you know, we wanted to tell a, a kind of richer story and particularly a richer historical story about the emergence of kind of inclusive institutions, you know, and, and we started asking ourselves, okay, if you have if you don't have inclusive institutions how do you get to them okay and and you know and what's the path that you take you know so to give you an example you know if you were uh, if you've read francis fukuyama's book fukuyama says oh well there's a very well defined path you know first of all you develop a strong state and then modernization you know broadens political rights or freedoms or creates democracy or something so you go up and then you go across okay but the more we thought about that, the less we believed it. You know, I don't think the data supports that. We've done a lot of research on that, on this modernization hypothesis. And if anything, this looks like you're really going to get stuck here, you know, because if you get stuck with a strong state with a very narrow distribution of power, then whoever controls the state can use that state strength to repress society and maintain its power. OK, down here, you know, in a place like Somalia or Lebanon, there's another society where in some sense power is very broadly spread in different, in different communities throughout the society, but the central state is extremely weak. Uh, that makes it very difficult to actually construct a central state when power is so spread and, you know, so, so, so how is it that, you know, so here's the book, the why, this is one way of thinking about where that what the narrow corridor is about how is it you get to these include you you, you don't go this way you don't go that way you go kind of along the diagonal so actually inclusive societies are societies that kind of built state strength at the same time power became more broadly distributed so they went kind of along the diagonal and that the narrow corridor you know in some sense is a sort of is a corridor in the middle you know, where the state and society is balanced and, and maintaining that balance is it's a narrow corridor. So maintaining that balance is, di is difficult and, and it's a process and it's a struggle between the state and the society. And, and so that's, that's what the book is about. And I think that, 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 that's something that you just alluded to, Chris, Christina, that, 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 that there's this a process and it does have authoritarian aspects to it, you know, because the state is always trying to control society, you know, the British state, historically, you know, tried to control society and repress society, it sent people to penal colonies, you know, put them in prison and society fought back and contested. And, you know, and so that's, that comes across, I think, much better in the new book than, than in Why Nations Fail. I mean, I think, you know, just in terms, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying about patenting, but I, I, you know, again, that's a, you know, like, why is there no, you know, I, you know, I think that's, that's, once you've invented these things, 
I mean, this is the sort of canonical problem with innovation in some sense, you know, which is that ideas or, you know, they're like, uh, you know, they're, they're like a public good. They're like a pure public good. You know, if you, if you have an idea, then once, you know, I can use it and I you know, but then if I just use it for free, you don't make any wealth out of it. And so that lessens your incentive in the pure kind of economic world, you know. So, so I think there's a very, you know, there's a complicated trade-off in terms of, intellectual property rights sort of stimulate innovation, but at the same time, they, you know, they exclude people from using something which would be incredibly valuable to them. Uh, uh, you know, and they also give monopoly power in some sense, you know, because you give monopoly power, which means, you know, you get to sell, you become a kind of intellectual monopolist. So you get to extract monopoly rents from other people, you know, and, and you know, that can be inefficient for the usual reasons. So I, I would sort of say, you know, again, my sense of the evidence is that the patent system has been very good at stimulating innovation, but it definitely has these negative effects also that you're, you're, you identify. I mean, I, 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 I definitely agree with that. And, 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 you know, and, and why is the, this is the problem with capitalism, you could say also, like, why is there no cure for malaria? You know, well, because, 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 because Pfizer can't make money selling it to Africans, you know, because they're not wealthy enough. So they don't care and they don't bother innovating, you know. So, but when it comes to COVID and we're all dying, you know, then, 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 you know, then the, 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 they just throw money at it and you have a solution in six months. But that doesn't happen with malaria, you know, because, you know, because, because, but because, because you don't make money out of it. You know, so that's, I mean, that's well understood in economics. I say that's a market failure. That's a role for government intervention, for subsidization of healthcare and innovation and all, all things like that. But, you know, obviously that's imperfectly, highly imperfectly implemented. Yeah. Great. But Thank you so much, perfect. Professor, for your reflections. Um, if we may, one last question from the audience okay. and then we can wrap it up. Um, a question from Clara. Uh, what are your thoughts on the rise of right-wing populism in the states you just labeled as institutionally inclusive, uh, the UK and USA? And how does this relate to your notion of balancing state and society? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a good question. We talk about that in the new book. I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure we have a great I'm not sure I really understand it. I mean, we, we talk about how, you know, in this balance, this balance is sort of unstable. You know, it's, it's a kind of contest. It's not, it's not a sort of, it's not an engineering problem. It's not like you get some people together in Philadelphia in 1788 and they, they come up with a recipe and everything is just like hunky-dory after that. It's a, it's a, you know, the state is always trying to control society and society is trying to get the state under control and it's a, and it, and it, and it, and, it, and it's a contest. And so, so I, you know, like my own view, I said earlier, I'm a kind of, I'm a sort of, you know, people, I, you know, I mentioned inequality earlier. And, you know, I do think that's a problem. But, but you know, I, my sense is that, you know, in the United States, it's more politics driving, dr driving the whole thing. You know, I mean, it's, you know, of course, populism is coming, you know, in, in Brazil and in, in, in the Philippines, and you could even say in India or Hungary. And so, so there's, I must say, I'm struggling you know, as a social scientist to kind of understand the connections between all these different things. You know, people talk about that as populism, you know, but, but it's very difficult for me to kind of understand, you know, why is it in the Philippines people elect President Duterte? That, to me, that's coming from somewhere completely different from, you know, what's going on in Hungary or what, what's going on in the United, what's going on in the United States. But, but I, you know, I would say that, you know, to me, it's, as I said, I'm, I'm a sort of, I tend to be a political determinist. You know, to me, if you look at, like, say, if you look at data on polarization in U.S. politics, it's mostly to do, it's, it starts, you know, it starts with the pact, you know, the pact for America or whatever it is Newt Gingrich did. You know, it starts with these sort of political strategies that Republicans used to try to make it more difficult to agree with. It's like a political strategy. You know, if I make it more difficult to make an agreement with the Democrats, then the Democrats have to make more concessions to me. So I get, I get closer to what I what I what I what I want. So there's a sort of rise of kind of extremism, you know, within within particularly within the Republican Party. I don't know. That's you know that's my perception. Maybe if you're a Republican, you think that the, the extremism is in the Democratic uh, Party. You know, uh, but there's this, been this enormous polarization. If you look at work by political scientists, you know about kind of Congress people's sort of preferred policies. They kind of 
they used to overlap and now they're just completely kind of disjoint, you know. So, so there's been this enormous polarization of the political system. I don't think anyone really understands what's driving that. You know, it seems to me it's more to do, you know, I don't know, you know, it's to do with Ronald Reagan, it's to do with this, you know, this particular model of politics that emerged, you know, with Mrs. Thatcher, you know, I grew up under Mrs. My, when I was a student, Mrs. Thatcher was prime minister and it was the same kind of model of, of this, you know, and, and so, so that's, you know, that's, but I, I think it's a very, I don't have a simple theory of all this sort of populism. I wish I, I wish I, I wish I did, you know, and, 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 I, and I don't, uh, to me, President Trump is a complete mystery. You know, I, I like what are people, you know, maybe that's just, that's, that's indicative of a polarization in this society. You know, I, you know, he is a, he's a fool. You know, he's an egotistical loudmouth. He's obnoxious. He's sexist. He's racist. You know, why, what appeals to anybody about this man? It's just mysterious, mysterious to me. But perhaps the fact that it's mysterious reflects the polarization in this society that I just don't understand you know, like there's a very nice book by Arlene Hothschild, who's a sociologist at UC Berkeley called Strangers in Their Own Land. I mean, there's some interesting books now trying to kind of understand this massive sort of fault line that's appeared in politics in the United States. And, and I'm not sure I really understand it. And I'm not sure I really understand, you know, people say inequality because we know inequality. Ah, I don't know. I don't know. It's a, it's a very bad answer to a, to an important question. But I, I sort of, you know, like I, one of the reasons I study history is that I find it very hard to study things in real time. You know. Thank you, Professor, for your reflections. Nonetheless, we appreciate them. <laughs> uh, all right. I think we've come to the end of the questions. I'll maybe hand over to Mike for some closing remarks and um, some promo for the next event. Uh, thank you very much, Christina, and thank you everybody for submitting questions. I definitely know what book is going to be on my reading uh, reading list next. So thank you again, Professor, for joining us. Okay. Once more, everybody, sorry about the mix-up today, and uh, thank you all very much for joining us again, whether it's uh, morning, afternoon, or evening for you. I think it is a good time to wrap it up because I can, I'm starting to hear the thunder rolling in from the window. So, <laughs> okay. but, uh, Professor, if there's any last remarks you wanted to make, uh, please feel free. I'm, I'm good. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yes. All righty. Well, thank you, everybody. And please uh, join us next Wednesday, uh, the 28th, for our final session in the series, where we will be talking with distinguished fellow of the Asia Global Institute, Mr. Andrew Shang, as we consider some of these things we have learned from session one, currency plurality, in this session here, what we have learned about inclusive and uh, extractive institutions, and try to troubleshoot some visions for the future. I hope to see you all there. And of course, Professor, you are invited if you are available, uh, but I totally understand you are a very busy man. I'm busy, yes. <laughs> all righty, well, thank you everybody. Okay. This meeting much. is officially Thanks. adjourned. Thanks very much, bye-bye. Great, thank you everyone. Take care, thank you, Professor. Bye, thank, thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.